Hello folks, we're Pastors Tim and Barbara Rigdon of The Well at New Covenant. Thank you for tuning in with us. We hope that something that is said today or, or maybe a song that is sung, we hope that it will touch your heart. Our prayer is to be blessed and yes. to take a drink and never thirst again yes. in Jesus. Said. And so we say around here, watch, watch as you, you are, are. You, you won't be the same. I want to talk to you about insignificant obedience. I want you to see the definition of insignificant. Insignificant means too small or unimportant to be worth, to be of worth or consideration. Too small or unimportant to be of worth or consideration. Or if it's talking about a person, it's a person that's without power or influence or meaningless. And see, I believe that some of you have felt this. Well, I'm unimportant. I'm too small. I don't have any power. I don't have any influence. I'm meaningless. But I'm here to tell you that God has created you just like you are. And He's placed you where you're supposed to be for such a time as this. And when you start to rise up and be what God has called you to be, that even in the midst of your insignificance, God's going to do miraculous things, not only to you, but through you. I believe that. Amen. <laughs> You know, we prayed in the prayer room this morning, and it's something that God spoke to me for years now. I'm just a donkey he rides into town on. Amen? I'm nothing more. He can use any donkey to speak this morning, and he's doing it all across America, especially, hallelujah, right now as we speak. I'm just a donkey. We're just the churches, just a conduit to let him flow. So what may look insignificant to you may be changing somebody's life somewhere. Amen? And if we didn't believe in what God is doing, then why stream it? Why pop it out? But I believe that there's something manifesting. Amen. I believe there's something about the little things that God wants to do in these last days. Amen. We've seen the big things. We've seen nothing against them. I'm not speaking about any big ministry. Hallelujah. I'm not doing that at all because God spoke to me this week and said a critical spirit will cripple a move of God. A critical spirit will will cripple and move a God. Let me put it this way. You get a critical spirit, it'll also manifest in your personal life. <laughs> if you're critical about all things, watch your criticalness. That's another whole message to it. But God began to speak to me about these things and says, you know, if you're going to do something, you've got to believe in something. You've got to believe that He's doing something that's worthy of things. And I believe that what God's doing here is worthy to be going forth. I believe it's worthy to be getting our neighbors and our friends and our family and saying, hey, you need to come to church. You know, when we say come as you are, you won't leave the same. It's not because of any of you or any of me. You understand that? It's because we believe in what God is doing. And we can't, you can't manufacture a move of God, okay? You can't advertise it enough. You can't do this enough. You know, you can't do that. Either God's moving or He's not. Amen. He's God, not us. He's God. He will do what He desires when He desires. But here's the thing you can do. You can stand in the way against the move of God. <clears throat> you can get in the way. It's just like this morning when Sister Leslie had that, that, that uh, she was feeling the unction of the Lord. And she went and pulled Brent to the side. <laughs> Amen. See, that's the correct way. <laughs> that ain't out of order. That's an order. <laughs> that's an order. Because when I'm not down here... <laughs> I've said, Brent, you kind of flow with things because the Bible says to do things in decency and order. 
Amen. She had something. She went to him. Now, sometimes he's going to say no. Sometimes he's going to look at me, and I'm going to say no because it's according to what the Spirit of the Lord is doing that we're, I'm responsible for this. Amen. I'm responsible for this pulpit. I'm responsible for this mic, what goes forth. And if I don't feel it's something that the Lord wants at that moment in time, don't be offended. I love you, but I'm going to say no. But this morning it was in the season and the timing of God. And guess what? There's some lives changed already. You know what's awesome about that? Pastor Tim's on the piano. He didn't lay hands on nobody. Do you understand that? Why is that so awesome? I'll tell you why that's so awesome. Because the body is learning to do the work of the ministry. He said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists, the fivefold ministry. Why? For the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Yeah. Amen. It's my job to equip you. Then it's my job to kick you out of the boat and tell you to walk on water and step out by faith. <laughs> Amen. And that's why we're trying to make an atmosphere where you can be utilized and your gifting or the anointing that's upon your life that God has shared with you can be utilized to the greatest ability. <laughs> now, I love what Brent said even before the service, talking about Brother Gary and some of the things he does there. But it's with everybody that's involved in the service behind the scenes, from musicians to uh, Miss Kelly. I want to tell you what, uh, you want to know something? Miss Kelly Cotton up there, she's been turning the slides and putting the words up there for how many years now? 16, 17 years? Close to that. That's called faithfulness, folks. That's called faithfulness. That's called a servant's heart. Oh, she's just flipping the computer thing. Yeah, but she's here on Wednesday nights. She don't sing. She don't play an instrument, but she's here on Wednesday night flipping the screen. Amen. She's here early on Sunday mornings. What? So... Pastor can see the words because I don't know the words of songs. I'm terrible at things like that. <laughs> Amen. But what I'm saying is, I'm not giving kudos to this. What I'm saying is, they take their gifting. And your gifting may look like not much to somebody. And you say, well, I don't sing. I don't do this. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you some other giftings. <clears throat> I seen some things last night. Uh, uh, I love football. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, I think it's of God. And uh, <laughs> Okay, maybe I'm stretching that part a little bit. Forgive me on that, okay? <clears throat> but here's the thing. I saw last night uh, with the Alabama-Georgia game, <laughs> and I despise Alabama. <laughs> I'm being honest, but I'm a Tennessee fan, so Tennessee fan, we've never got along with Alabama fans, okay? <clears throat> but I'm sitting there, and my wife heard me say, yeah, because <laughs> I was watching the game. She goes, what did you just do? I said, I can't help it. <laughs> she said, that was Alabama that scored. I said, I know. <laughs> I'm confessing my faults before my brethren right now. <clears throat> I literally cheered from inside when I seen the backup quarterback who, who was the starting quarterback and SEC Player of the Year last year who got pulled from the national championship game because he wasn't good enough <clears throat> to get his second chance because the other quarterback got hurt. And they were down by 14 points. And he brings them back to win by seven points. <clears throat> You know what? And then when I saw the interview after the, after the game, uh, I said, what was you thinking about that? And he says, that God can do anything through me. <laughs> he took his insignificant role as a backup quarterback, but yet when his moment came, come on, he took it and he did all that he could through Jesus through him, and then he gave God the glory. <laughs> See, you may not have a gifting in singing or preaching or teaching or doing this or that or whatever, but if you take whatever gift it is of yours and you take the anointing of God upon that, and it may look insignificant to you, but I'm going to tell you what, it's going to open up doors for you because the Bible says in Proverbs that my gift makes room for me. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And it will open doors. I, I, me and Barb got to say, we was in a meeting and we got running late and it was a, we got there about halftime uh, to see Miss Carly play basketball this week. And, I mean, their team is just tearing it up. Uh, uh, go Trojans. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it's just awesome. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> and I'm just, I'm just bragging on somebody's gift. Uh, as far as I know, and I may not have all the stats right, but she's over 20 points a game, I know. I don't know what that. Her daddy, I know, can tell me the average. I saw him on his phone keeping up with everything. 24 or 20.6. 20, 20. 20. 23.6 <laughs> points a game. <laughs> Amen. 
I mean, if you get the Cat Paul's magazine, she's in there. <laughs> Amen. And uh, we're so proud of her. And that's her gift. And stuff. But let me tell you something about somebody's gift. When you take your gift and you give it to God, God does great things through it. <laughs> you know what? She's had invitations and chances to, this is her senior year to sign with all kinds of different colleges, Division I, uh, even SEC colleges, all these big colleges and stuff. She signed the other day. I, meant to, I didn't have an opportunity last week to talk about it, but she signed Friday a week ago with Liberty University, a Christian university, <laughs> so that she can give God glory. <laughs> You know what? That's what I'm saying. That may look insignificant to you, but I'm going to tell you what. <coughs> I bet you, uh, I'm not, uh, that's the wrong word to say. <laughs> but I can guarantee you that the uh, softball for Liberty University is going to be put on the map in the big scheme of things. <laughs> not because of just her, but because of the God that's working only to her, but through her, because she's going to give God glory. And it's going to make some changes in people's lives. <laughs> Amen. And, and I, just, I, I believe that. And you say, well, I don't know about this. It's because when you have what you think is insignificant, it becomes much with God. Amen. And so insignificant obedience. It says, look here. This is a, a familiar story that nobody preaches about unless you're preaching about, somebody, about offering. And I'm not talking about an offering today in the sense of your pocketbooks. I'm talking about you offering the, whatever you've got to God. Amen. And this is the woman, uh, is the widow's mite. You might know the story. It says, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. And then a poor widow came up and dropped in two small coins or two mites. It says, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. She gave more than all the rest. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus. See, some of you are just giving your gift out of surplus. You're not giving it all. But it says, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. I want to tell you something. When you take your gifting and you give it all, can I put it in terms you might understand? You go all in. When you go all in with Jesus, with your gifting, when you go all in with Jesus, with everything that's in your being, all of a sudden things begin to change. That God can take a little and make much out of it. That He can take a handful and make it an abundance. But it's when we go all in. See, it's the mentality that she's not saying, hey, mine's recognizable, or hey, I'm putting this in so everybody can look at me, look at me. No, she's giving her gift so that she can sow what she has to the Lord. Why? Because she believed in the Lord. She believed in the obedience of the Lord. And I believe if we're walking in insignificant good obedience. What looks to the world as not being much, that all of a sudden God is going to exalt that. And God's going to manic, magnify, magnify that and, and manifest His glory not only to it, but through it. The reason I, I think these things is, you know, when you look in Job 8, 7, it says, Though your beginning was small, yet your latter, or the later things, the latter end would increase abundantly. Yes. <laughs> abundantly. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm not talking about your offering you put in this morning. I'm talking about everything that's in you. When you give over to God, everything that's within you. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Even in Proverbs, it talks about when we honor the Lord with the first fruits of our increase, but then it says, and with all of our substance. <laughs> You know, if you pick somebody up from church today and brought them to church because they didn't have a ride, your car is your substance, and you honored the Lord by bringing somebody to church. If you've had people over to your house just to bless them and fix them supper, if you've had people over to have a Bible study, or you've went and took the time to pray with people, you know, or, or minister to somebody, or love on somebody, or visit somebody in the hospital or in jail or whatever, guess what? You're honoring the Lord with your substance. And when we start to honor God with everything in us, that even though it may be insignificant or small, the latter is it's going to increase abundantly. Amen? Amen. And I believe this to be a manifestation of it. I've got to get into this thing, because here's where I'm trying to get to. 1 Kings 17. You may know this story. Hallelujah. This is, there's a famine in the land because there's a drought in the land. And, you know, the prophet went to the king and said, hey, it ain't going to rain so I give the word for it to rain because until you repent, it ain't going to rain. <laughs> All right? So then the word of the Lord came to him. And see, he'd been sitting by the brook. You know, and the ravens had been feeding him morsels of bread and meat. And he'd been drinking from the brook. But then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, 
and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. <laughs> now, you know, even in biblical times especially, a widow represented poverty. Amen. It didn't represent abundance. It didn't represent blessings. It represent lack. Okay? So I want you to take note of that ahead of time. But he said he commanded a widow or a person of lack to provide for you. I believe that if we'll realize something, that we are gathering together people of lack to provide for the kingdom of God right now in these days and now. Yeah. That we may be, you know, you look around here at this church, they, we ain't got no rich people that's multi-millionaires, unless you don't tell me about it. But anyway, <laughs> I don't think somebody uh, owns Microsoft or what. But what we got is a lot of people that are working people yeah. or have worked hard for what they've got if they have anything or even some that are struggling or whatever. But God takes the insignificant. Yeah. You hear me? The insignificant. And he's bringing abundance to the things. It's insignificant things that looks like to the world. But God's taking this little bit here and here. Why? Because it's obedience. He said, arise and go. I'm going to make a woman of black, a widow there, to provide for you. And look what he says. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow or a woman of lack was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little cup of a little water in, uh, in a cup that I may drink. <laughs> okay, he sees the woman of lack gathering sticks. And he says, bring me a cup of water, please. Look what goes on. And as she was going to get it, she was being obedient to the prophet, to the man of God. He called her and he says, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now, here's the thing you've got to realize. It's not that the prophet or the man of God is being uh, unaware of this woman's situation. He knew it was a widow to begin with because God said it was. He knew it was a woman of lack because he knew what he was getting into before he got here. But yet, he had a word from God that says, that woman's going to provide for you. I want to tell you, the word of God trumps any circumstance that you may see from the outside. <laughs> the word of God trumps any situation that you think, well, how can God take this lack? Or how can God use this? Or how can God use a church full of people in an old bank building that's 115 years old to reach the world? Because God will reach past our lack. God will reach past our circumstances to bring a morsel of bread. But look what this woman says to him. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have any bread. She didn't have bread. So there's only a handful of flour. Remember I told you remember the handful I only got a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks here, prophet. You see what I'm doing here? I'm gathering sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son and that we can eat it and die. I ain't got nothing. I've got enough for one more meal. I got enough for one more time and I'm going to make this and me and my baby, we're going to eat this and then we're going to just die. But yet the word of the Lord says, go and there's a widow, a woman of lack, who's going to provide for you. <laughs> so I, I look at this and I thought, man, that's cold. You know he knew when she said that, that, man, there's going to be, that's a bad deal and bad circumstance. Not only is she a woman of lack, but there's famine in the land. There's, there's a drought in the land. There's all these things. And here he's calling upon her to give the last that she has. To sow into him. <clears throat> Why? He wasn't just being greedy or say, gimme, gimme, gimme. He had a word from God to speak this to her. <laughs> and I want you to see something that happened. <laughs> he knew she only had a handful. He knew she had a little oil. He knew she was gathering up sticks to just feed her and her baby one more time. <laughs> but yet in the midst of that, he didn't take note that she was cooking enough to get her and her baby one more meal. He still required of her, make me a morsel of bread. Look here what he says. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as I've said. Do what I said, woman. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, when you put this in context, can you not imagine this woman? 
she just pleaded with him, man, I ain't got but a handful and a little oil and I'm gathering sticks and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fix a meal for me and my baby. I'm going to feed me and my baby, then we're going to die. And then the prophet Elijah says to her, okay, do not fear, but you go do what I said. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but do what I said because I'm coming to you as a word from the Lord. <laughs> but make me a small cake from it first. First. You know, I'm, I'm sure if Elijah had one of his uh, guys standing next to him, maybe he was, if he had had some, he'd walk around with him, come with him, you know, his, his assistant prophet or whatever. <coughs> you know, they might have been like, uh, Elijah? <laughs> She's not here this woman say she just got a handful, a little oil. And, so, and then you're telling her, make you one first. <laughs> I mean, they're going to eat this and die, dude. I mean, there's a famine, there's a, there's a drought, there's all this. And here you're saying, I hear what you said, don't be scared, guess what? Just do what I said and make me one first. If you read the King James this, I can tell that Elijah was from the south because he said, fetch me a cake. <laughs> so here's a man, that he's a prophet, he understands and knows and is all knowing, but yet still, make me one first and bring it to me. Then after, you go feed it for you and your son. Now, did you see right here? He doesn't say, make me one first, then afterwards you go feed you and your son and you ain't going to die. He doesn't say anything about that right here. He didn't say you ain't going to die. He didn't say the famine's going to be over. He doesn't say the, 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 the drought's going to be done with. He didn't say any of those things. He said to her, don't be in fear. And Sister Leslie had no idea what I'm preaching about today. <laughs> don't be in fear. God knows you only got a handful left. But when you put God first, somebody going to get this. When you only got a handful, that ain't when you hoard it up and hold on to it. Because if you do, you're going to just die. But when you hold on to it, or, but when you start to release it, and you hear the Word of God, and you begin to release that gift, and release that thing that God has given you, and that anointing God's put upon your life, that even though it don't look like much, that when you give it to God first, guess what? Something's going to change in your life. <laughs> Look here. Afterwards, you and yourself. Like I said, he made no mention that the drought's going to stop, the famine's going to stop, or that you ain't going to die at this point in Scripture. He hadn't said nothing. But look what he goes on. <laughs> For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the, shall the jar of oil run dry until the, Lord, the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. <laughs> Amen. There's when the promise came. That first part said she went on her way, but he said, guess what? Make me one first, and then you make one for your youngin'. Make me one first. I propose to you today that when we begin to put God first in things, things change. There's something about putting first. There's been people even come to me here recently and say, listen, I'm going to be gone, and you know, i got to bring my tie check. And I said, well, you can just put it in next week or whatever. I said, no, i got to put it in first because it's the first fruits. And I'm like, you're getting it. People are getting it. They understand there's something about the first fruits. There's something, that, you know, and this is not a, a message about your, your offering. This is not about money. This is about everything in life. Everything we do, and we do in life is sowing and reaping. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. If you sow discontentment everywhere you go, that's what you're going to reap back a hundredfold. You know, if you sow uh, being a bad person towards other people and treating people wrong, guess what? You're going to reap it, reap it back. It's coming back to you. Everything we do is, is, is sowing and reaping. Uh, uh, Hebrews, I mean, uh, Genesis talks about it. It says, as long as heaven and earth exist, exist so will seed time and harvest time. You know, so as long as long as this earth's around, hallelujah, there's going to be a sowing and there's going to be a reaping of things in your life. And when you understand this, that all of a sudden what Elijah's telling this woman, you know what, if you give to me first, if you'll take care of the man of God first, if you'll do this, guess what, I'm going to take care of you, the, Lord, or the Lord's going to take care of you, and that bin of flour that's been, will not be used up, nor shall the oil run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the earth. Now the significance of this all is this. That when you're faithful over those first things and giving to the Lord first in each and everything, give the Lord the first time of the day. <coughs> what do you mean, Pastor, give the Lord the first time of the day? I want to tell you what, if some of you would get into a habit of the first thing that you do in the morning as you spend some time with the Lord, I guarantee you your days would be going a little bit better than what they've been going. <coughs> Just a thought. <coughs> Hallelujah. Give it to God first. 
Well, I always pray late at night, brother, when I have things, have things slow down. That's great. And Daniel prayed morning, noon, and night. That's all great. But I'm here to tell you there's something about giving God time first. <laughs> Amen. Just a thought. You take it, leave it, wear it, put it in your back pocket, carry it home with you, or flush it. I don't care. But I'm here to tell you, I found it to be true that when I put God first in my day and I spend some time with God. So she went. There was the obedience. Insignificant obedience. It was just a handful. But she took a handful, according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah uh, was spoke by Elijah. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the prophet, of the Lord. Amen. Now, here's the problem with modern day Christianity, especially independent uh, type non-denominational churches or faith churches or you know we get so much into name it claim it blabbing it and grabbing it and stuff like that that we miss what God is doing <clears throat> see some of us would not have been satisfied with that why because it's not shaking down running over there's nothing here that says that that bin of flour run over or the oil run over but it said that every time she reached for a handful there was a handful to come out Every time. See, some of you don't realize, and because you ain't got the biggest, fanciest car and house and all this money in the bank and stuff, you don't feel like that you're walking in the blessings of God. I'm going to tell you what, if you go to your bank account and there's something in there, you bless the Lord, you know? <laughs> Let me give you another one. If you go to your bank account and there ain't nothing there and you still pay your bills, you're blessed of the Lord. <laughs> We're looking for an overflow, and when God's saying right here, all you need is a handful when you're obedient with it. When you reach in and you get a handful. See, we don't have to have the latest, greatest, fanciest things to do what God's told you to do. This woman, all she had was a word from Elijah that everything was going to be all right till the rain came. Elijah didn't tell her, hey, you know, you ain't going, there ain't going to be no famine, ain't going to be no drought. Ain't gonna be, he said it ain't going to run out. Until the Lord sends down the rain again. Guess what? It did exactly what the word of the Lord said. It never ran out. She went to it. And it didn't just feed her and her family. She fed the man of God too. You see that? That wasn't just enough. That's really abundance. But because we didn't see the pot of oil running out on the floor and the, the flower being running out on the floor, we didn't say it was abundance. It's any time it's abundance when you serve a God that's not just enough, but he's more than enough. It was enough to help somebody else and feed a prophet. So see, there was a hidden thing of abundance inside of that that we missed. Amen. I'm, right quickly. Amen. I just It's just about these small things. You know, John 6, 8 says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, and Peter's brother said to him, there's a lad here who's got five loaves of bar barley and, and two small fish. But what are they among so many? What's two fishes when I got 5,000 I've got to deal with? Do you understand this? Now, we're talking about churches. We're talking about giftings in people's lives. We're talking about ministry. We're talking about that, all these things. But I'm here to tell you, this right here is a spirit of overwhelmed. <laughs> He's overwhelmed. There's a big crowd. What are we going to do? We got two fishes. Now, I'm saying this because of this one thing. <laughs> I'm breaking the spirit of overwhelmness off of this body of believers and anybody watching during Christmas time because you say, I've got this kid and I've got this bill and I've got this going on. What am I going to do because I only got $2 or I only got two whatever? Because you're overwhelmed by the season. You're overwhelmed by the traditions of men. Hello? I'm not critical of those things, okay? But you're being overwhelmed by the traditions of men and you're letting it overtake you that you're forgetting and missing what God says about the season that we're in. Hello? Now, I know that ain't the most popular thing. I'm not anti-Christmas and gifts and things like that. I'm not. I'm going to do that thing. Uh, my grandbaby is going to be blessed. <coughs> now, our youngins, they may not get much this year. but 
<laughs> All them are watching or turning off their TV right now. <laughs> but you understand. It's about being a blessing, but it's not about getting to the place of being overwhelmed. And then when overwhelmness comes upon your life, then there's fear. What do you tell the woman? Fear not. Because God's got a plan when you put Him first. God's going to take your handful and it ain't going to run out. You hear me? I believe there's people that you're figuring out, how, how can I do this? How can I do that? How can I get this for my babies? And how can I do that? When you put God first, a handful's enough. You understand me? A handful's enough. It was enough not just to feed her and her children and her household, but it was enough to take care of even more than that. Why? Because she gave to God first. Amen. There was the lad and said, but there's so many of them. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there's much grass in this place. So the men sat down and number was about 5,000. <clears> thing people don't realize, it didn't say he fed 5,000. There's 5,000 men. A lot of them had their wives and their children with them. So it's 5,000 plus, okay? <clears throat> it says Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. <laughs> Here's the thing. When Jesus takes the little, or the handful, and he gives thanks, and, in other words, he blesses it. You know, you know, we say for a meal, we say, say the blessing. That's giving thanks. When Jesus blessed it, the disciples that were sitting down, and likewise he did the fish, as much as they wanted that became an all-you-can-eat fish buffet. I love me a seafood buffet. <coughs> I buffet myself pretty good at those. <coughs> I get down to the to Florida and stuff. You know, and our kids, we try to go down there. What's the first thing on our list? Seafood. <coughs> We're going to see the ocean, breathe in a big, big breath of air, see the sunshine, and say, when are we going to eat? That's my plan. That's a vacation for me. <coughs> Salt air, warm, and good food. <coughs> I'm done. <laughs> yep. Let me lay down in the chair out there like a beached whale and just <laughs> enjoy doing nothing. But they had all they wanted. Why? Because Jesus blessed a handful. Why? Because the lad gave it to him first. <laughs> the lad could have said, oh, man, there's a bunch of people and nobody came prepared I've got my lunch bag here. I'm going to hide this so nobody sees. Instead, he said, here, I know it ain't much, but I'll give what I got. <laughs> when you know it ain't much and you give what you got, just like the woman, the, the widow with the might, just like the widow <laughs> with the prophet, and just like the lad here, when Jesus blesses it and you give it to him first, it's going to feed not only you and your household, but even more, and it's going to be all that they wanted. Hallelujah. It's even going to go to the pack that so that when they were filled, didn't say that they said, okay, here's you one bite of fish, and here's you one. No, they got full. They got full. When they got filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost or nothing is wasted. Amen. Hallelujah. Therefore, they gathered up and they filled 12 baskets of the fragments and the bar five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. See, you've got to realize there's an importance of, so that nothing is lost. Sometimes when people get into an abundance, <laughs> you become like what they say around my neck of the woods, you become redneck rich. You know what I'm talking about. You get that tax return, woo glory, and then it's gone a week later. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. Okay. <laughs> Too close to home. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? When you do get a little bit, we just blow it on stuff. Man, I'm getting new rims from my truck. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing. You know, and ain't nothing wrong with any of those things. It's your money. You work hard for those things. But I'm here to tell you, God's saying this. When you give to me first and I begin to bless you, you're going to have an abundance that's going to come around your way. Now, I don't want you to lose it either. He didn't spoke out. He's preaching my message. We got to be good stewards of not just what God has given us the handful, but we've got to be good stewards of the abundance. 
Because until you're a good steward over the handful, you're not going to get the abundance. And when you're not a good steward of the abundance, you're not going to keep the abundance. <laughs> That'll preach. <laughs> you got to realize that. I'm not just talking about your money. <laughs> I'm talking about your life. <laughs> until you're a good steward over the joy that you have. Yes. Until you're a good steward over the peace you have. <laughs> You know what? I have people, they'll get all happy in church and they'll get all full of joy and say, man, I just feel like a burden's lifted off of me. Then they go back and they're not a good steward over it. And they lose their peace. They lose their joy. They lose a lot of things. Why? They're not faithful over the abundance that God has given. What are we supposed to do that abundance? So it's somebody else. <laughs> hey, I hear you going through some stuff. Guess what? You can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what I got. Let me pray for you. Release the joy. Release the peace of God. You can have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Oh, I know it's Christmas time. I know you're lonely. I know you're frustrated. I know you're disappointed in things. I know you're missing this person or that person that may not be around. But I'm here to tell you, God is more than enough. And He's got, give Him your handful right now because He's about to send you peace. The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, is about to comfort you during this time that you're about to realize and you're going to remember the good things and you're going to be joyful in the things of God. And it's not going to be a time of frustration. It's not going to be a time of disappointment. It's not going to be a time of depression. Because <coughs> we're going to give our time even to the Lord, that handful. Amen? Hallelujah. Then those men that was seen in the sign that Jesus said, this is true, the prophet of God is coming to the world. I want to tell you what the prophecy of the Lord is. Little is much in the hands of God. A little dab will do you, so to speak. <coughs> a little handful can go a long way when God's been put first. Amen. Folks, we want to thank you for tuning in with us today. We hope that something has been said or done here today that has touched you, and we just pray for you right now. We want to lead a prayer right now as we close this service out. Amen. So just right there, if something's touched your yes. heart, if uh, something's deal dealing with your heart, whether yes. it be to come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or if you've known Him, you've drawn away from right. Him, and you're wanting to draw back, if you need healing to your yes. body, if you need a touch, whatever it may be, deliverance, if you need to be set free from yes, drugs, sir. alcohol, addictions, right. God is a mountain-moving yes, God. He He's still in the saving business. He's still in the delivering business. Yes. And so we want to pray with you. So just join with us yes, as we join our Jesus. faith with you. Yes, Lord God. Jesus, we ask you right yes. now that whoever's watching out there, yes, or whatever their need may be, God, that you meet them right now. Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit to go down there wherever they're at, whether they're watching on their phone or on their computer or a Roku. Lord, that you just touch them right there and just embrace them with your Holy Spirit. Yes. Lord, we ask for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to change their life. Lord, we ask for the encouragement of the Holy Ghost, Lord, just to begin to reach down and lift them up and real, yes, them realize Lord. that there's a purpose Jesus. in their life. There's a purpose in the situation they're going through. There's even a purpose in your pain. And God, for those that need healing in their body, Lord, we pray that the divine touch of the Holy Spirit, yes, that Lord. Lord, you touch them at the, wherever they are, whatever the pain yes, is, God. whatever the sickness or disease, disease. Lord, you said that by your stripes yes. they are healed. Yes. And Lord, we believe you and your word and we trust you and you're with your word. And Lord, I speak to addictions. I yes. speak against those that yes. are struggling with addictions in their life. Lord, I ask you to break off that yoke of bondage. You said you sent the anointing to break, annihilate, yes. and destroy every yoke of bondage. And Lord, we speak for them to be touched right now. And yes. God, we give you glory for what you're doing in people's lives ahead of time. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We thank you for watching. Remember, tune in the next time. Watch as you are. You, you won't, won't be the, be the same. same.